Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Cold Waters, the newest game out by Killerfish Games, the developers of Atlantic Fleet and Pacific Fleet, and a real-time third-person submarine uh, game which puts you in command of a United States, well at this point in time, a United States Navy submarine during a hypothetical Third World War. The developers are working on adding Russian submarines as well, uh, but uh, in the meantime, right now, the only subs available are uh, US, uh, U.S. based submarines. So in this video we're actually going to be returning to our series which we've been working our way through. We've successfully engaged one enemy force, we just failed to stop an invasion of Norway, um, but nonetheless we're returning to this series uh, of uh, Jack Ryan Jr., the commander of the USS Narwhal, which is a single ship class submarine largely based on the Sturgeon. It's a permutation of the Sturgeon class and uh, has some interesting unique elements to it. As we see these events come up on the map, the battle for Norway, um, you know, Soviet advances, U.S. counterattacks. I'm not really going to be talking about uh, the, the gameplay you see in front of you in this video. I'm going to be returning to what I've done in the last couple of videos, and I'm going to be talking about in particular, the USS Narwhal class, or the USS Narwhal submarine. Um, that's because this is the submarine that we're playing through in this campaign right now. It's the boat that's gotten us through the first, you know, four or five days into the war, and it's the boat that, you know, is going to try and keep us safe. And I think it's an interesting class of submarine to talk about. So I, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of jump in and talk about the history. Before I go too far down that line, though, I do want to talk about the Narwhal within the context of the game, because you may be interested in understanding, all right, uh, great, there's all this history about the boat, but, you know, I'm playing the game, and I want to know, what does the boat do for me in the game? You know, why would I choose the Narwhal over any other class of submarines? And I'm working on a really quick high-level comparison of U.S. subs within the game, um, but that'll be its own standalone video. However, since we are talking about the Narwhal, I think it makes sense to talk about the Narwhal in the game briefly, and then we'll jump into the history and, and kind of the interesting components of, of the Narwhal as Belgium falls to the Soviets. So really quick, if you were just going to read off the stat line of USS Narwhal, what would that be? Well, first of all, its length is 95.7 meters, I believe it is. Its beam is 10. That really doesn't mean anything to us in-game. Its displacement its di displacement is 5,300 tons, which actually kind of puts it in the mid-range of U.S. subs. The Skipjack, for example, is much smaller. The Los Angeles class is over 7,000 tons. The Narwhal is kind of in the middle there, uh, that, which matters, and I'll tell you why in a second. There's 107 crew members, again, doesn't really do much other than to make you feel guilty about how many people die when you fail as a, as a sub commander. Um, its surface max speed is 20 knots. If you're traveling on the surface with a narwhal, you're making a mistake. If you're traveling on the surface with any nuclear-powered submarine, uh, you're either running for your life because your sub can't survive below the surface, or you're a crazy man with a death wish. Submarines should not travel on the surface. This is not World War II, folks. This is the modern submarine era. Its submerged max speed is 25 knots, which is a little bit slow. Uh, the Los Angeles class, for example, can make over 30 knots. The Skipjack can make over 30 knots. Um, but its I don't believe it's the slowest. I think the permit might be like 23 knots. I'm not quite sure on that. But essentially, it's on the slower side. Um, it is... Uh, not the best handling of submarines, but it's also not uh, the, the most sluggish. So given its displacement and given its speed, it's less maneuverable than a skipjack, for example. So if you're trying to, you know, be a really loud submariner, which you probably shouldn't be, but if you're trying to be a really loud submariner and you're, you know, you're making a lot of noise and you want to know, all right, if there's eight torpedoes coming at me, how am I going to do? Or even if you're just in shallow waters and the enemy gets a quick shot on you and surprises you, the narwhal is not as maneuverable as a skipjack. The skipjack handles like a fighter. I'd say the narwhal handles more like, a, uh, I don't know, just kind of like a, a, a multi-role aircraft, strike aircraft, whatever. It's not... It's not a uh, super nimble uh, submarine, but it's also not sluggish. The Los Angeles class is very sluggish. Uh, it is, you know, the super modern weapon platform, but it's it's not great at, at maneuvering away. Its best defense is being undetected. The Narwhal, on the other hand, can outmaneuver the Los Angeles, but certainly is unable to outmaneuver the smaller submarines like the Skipjack. Um, 
With that being said, even though it's not as maneuverable as a skipjack, uh, and it's more maneuverable than a Los Angeles, in my mind, the Narwhal is almost the perfect submarine to play as for the Americans. That's because it's not as maneuverable as a skipjack, but the skipjack only has some, you know, a limited weapon selection. The Narwhal actually has all the weapons that the Los Angeles class has. It can have uh, T-LAM Tomahawk land attack missiles, Tomahawk anti-ship missiles, harpoons, uh, Mark 48 torpedoes. It has all of that. It also has a T B-16 towed sonar array. It has a modern sonar suite, and as best as I can tell, although the game doesn't really tell you how much noise you're emitting, it seems very difficult for the enemy to detect. I've, I've, I, I always am getting detected in the skipjack, and even so a little bit more in the Los Angeles class, but the Narwhal to me almost feels like the perfect submarine uh, to submariner as in this game, because it seems like it's, it's quiet, it's relatively maneuverable, although not super maneuverable, it has all the best weapons, its sonar to me feels like it has a little bit to be, you know, a little bit lacking although I'm not quite sure how it compares to the Los Angeles. I mean, I I can look through the stats and see what the different systems are, but I, I don't really know what some of these numbers in the, in the chart mean, so it's hard for me to say. Um, it has four torpedo tubes. It can have up to two torpedo wires going at a time, so if you launch Mark 48s and you want to keep it connected to the sub and allow you to maneuver the torpedo on the way in, it can only have two. I believe the Los Angeles can have up to four. Um, it has uh, up to six or up to 26 uh, torpedoes, so up to 20 26 weapons uh, that I can hold in its in its uh, arsenal, so a, a, a large arsenal, although again with four torpedo tubes, uh, it's kind of the standard. It's not overly powerful like the skipjack with six, but it's not uh, anything unusually, uh, unusually low. Um, torpedo reload times and noisemaker times to me look standard across all U.S. subs. 20 seconds to reload a noisemaker, 30 seconds to reload a torpedo tube. Uh, its crush depth is, uh, or its, its test depth, is 1,320 feet, so that is a very deep diving submarine. It can dive deeper than the Los Angeles or the Skipjack class. Um, its escape depth is 600 feet, so if you're below 600 feet and your sub is destroyed and you can't, or, you know, damaged and sinking and you can't surface, you're going to be unable to retrieve your crew. If you're above 600 feet, you'll be able to get your crew off. Um, and that's about all that's really worth mentioning in game. Now, I mentioned a few things about the the submarines, you know, seemingly uh, less uh, loud uh, signature. And I think that may be true, but I may also be projecting the submarine's own historical performance. So with all of the gameplay discussion about how the sub performs in game uh, and and what matters for you as far as being a gameplay uh, submariner, why don't we go ahead and talk about the skipjack as a um, as a as a historical platform. What was the skipjack? What you know? What were the considerations around its design? What was its performance? What was unique about it? Because the skipjack is the only submarine on the U.S. side in this game, and actually, it might be one of the few U.S. submarines that that was a combat you know platform, uh, which had a single ship in the class. Uh, it was the only Narwhal class. The USS Narwhal was alone. Again, it was a permutation in many ways of the Sturgeon class, and yet uh, there were no other. Narwhal class submarines, um, which makes it interesting to look at. Why was that the case? How was it different? Well, let's jump into that. Laid down in 1966 and completed in 1967, the USS Narwhal would remain in service until 1999, a service life of more than 30 years. In many ways, she was an experimental boat. She had many different features that would not be had not been used in submarines before her, and while she was theoretically in body, uh, a modified sturgeon, she was in many ways her own boat. Uh, she used what was called the S5G reactor, uh, which was a natural cir circulation nuclear reactor. I'm not a nuclear physicist, I'm not an engineer, but what that basically meant was that the reactor could operate without its coolant pumps. It didn't need pumps to, to push water through the nuclear reactor to keep it cooled. Those of you who don't know a ton about nuclear power understand that a new nuclear reactor is always going and it's always generating heat of some sort. If it doesn't have coolant flowing through it, you, you don't have the ability to completely stop it. Um, even even when you scram the reactor, there's still, my understanding, a little bit of, uh, of reaction going on, and there's still a lot of residual heat. So you really need a constant flow of coolant uh, to the reactor at all times in order to keep it cool. 
Um, I'm taking this from a engineering and a nuclear uh, nuclear paper about maritime reactors, uh, but this is this is a, a quote from it. So the S5G reactor was a prototype that operated in either a forced or natural circular circulation flow mode. The plant had two coolant loops and two stern uh, steam generators. It had to be designed with the reactor vessel situated low in the boat and the steam generators high in order for natural circulation of the coolant to be developed and maintained. Uh, The nuclear reactor was installed initially in a land-based prototype uh, at the Nuclear Power Training Unit in Idaho, uh, the National Engineering Laboratory near Idaho Falls. Um, But eventually it would be, after testing, it would be deployed to the USS Narwhal SSN-671, which is the boat that you see here in front of you today. It's interesting doing a little bit of reading about about the reactor, because really when it comes down to the narwhal, the question is, what makes the narwhal unique? And the biggest piece of what makes the narwhal unique, and a test bed, wasn't the only thing. They tested a lot of things out, but really the thing that stood out to me about the narwhal was its nuclear reactor. So that's why I'm going so extensively into that reactor. Uh, But one of the interesting things about the reactor is this was a prototype. It was very much the brainchild of uh, Admiral Rickover, who was kind of the, the brainchild of the United States nuclear fleet. And um, it was, again, it was an experimental piece, but it didn't just start with a submarine. This, the, the development of the Narwhal was long, uh, it was somewhat drawn out, uh, and it was a process that today you probably wouldn't see as much of, given the way that computers really help us design and tinker with things without building you know, massive, expensive projects. But at the time the Narwhal was built in the 60s, you didn't really have that as an option. So before they even built the Narwhal and put this experimental reactor into it, What they actually did was they built this prototype plant in Iowa, or sorry, Idaho, uh, and they did a wide variety of tests on this reactor to see if it would actually be able to perform in a submarine. So, for example, they built this large reactor in Idaho. They put it in a, a facility or in a kind of in a tube, if you will. They floated that tube on water to simulate being at sea in a submarine. So think of building a nuclear power plant and then taking the reactor of that power plant and putting it on water to see how things would work. If that wasn't enough, what they also did was they rotated the the tube or the power plant on its axis to be able to simulate a hard turn. So they would shift the reactor back and forth to understand, you know, would the reactor still get sufficient coolant so that it could maintain a strong enough reaction to power a nuclear submarine through evasive maneuvers and turns and what have you. So there was a lot of work that was done to make sure that this hypothetical gravity-powered uh, reactor, gravity-powered coolant system, wouldn't lose its effectiveness if a submarine's 500 feet down, you know, 30 degrees on the down plane, and 25 degree, you know, a 25 degree rudder turn. So as the, as the ship is turning and angling sharply, that that reactor has to maintain its flow of coolant. And in large part, it was it was successful. The reactor did have coolant pumps that were installed with it, uh, so that as the as the submarine, you know, would create some sort of, like, essentially if there was an emergency and the submarine had to crank its power up all the way to maximum, then they would still need some coolant pumps. But frankly, if you're turning out your max speed, even at depth, you're probably making a lot of noise as it is with all the other mechanical pieces in the submarine. So at that point, the reactor noise is a little bit of a secondary concern. Not that it wasn't a concern, because certainly stealth is still very important. And if you're at, at great depth, you could potentially operate at 25 knots or, you know, at your max speed relatively quietly, uh, but it was something that uh, they had this this backup coolant pump system, which basically had an on and an off switch. There weren't different levels of, of de- you know, degrees of how much was being pumped through. It was basically, it's either on or it's off, and it was only used in emergency situations or at full power mode. The reactor could operate uh, almost entirely without the need of these coolant pumps, even at substantial load uh, and at substantial speeds. Again, barring some sort of emergency where you, maybe you had to crank it up to flank in a, in a split second or something like that. At its time, the USS Narwhal had the quietest reactor plant in the United States Naval Fleet. It had a 90 megawatt uh, nuclear power plant, which actually generated a little bit more power than other fast attack nuclear submarines at that time. Um, you know, such as the third generation S3G and fifth generation S5W uh, reactors. Uh, the G and the W stand for either G for General Electric or W for Westinghouse. Um, 
in terms of their reactors. Uh, the Narwhal was, you know, with the fact that it had the quietest propulsion, it also had a pod that was attached to it uh, that uh, was suspected of being used to operate remotely controlled vehicles for outside the submarine, which could be used for tapping into communication cables, um, you know, maintaining uh, megaphone tracking systems at the bottom of the oceans, uh, or a whole slew of other uh, covert operations that could be conducted uh, with these remotely operated vehicles. In addition to that, the submarine did carry a towed sonar array. It wasn't something that was uniform at the time the submarine was built. It did become uniform later in the United States' sort of Cold War arsenal. But at the time, it was a modern innovation that the submarine did uh, house that not all of its predecessors initially came with. With that being said, you might say, well, if this reactor was so quiet, so successful, and more powerful than other reactors of its time, why was only one narwhal made? Well, as we already laid out, it was very much designed as kind of a, a test bed ship, a, a pet project that would examine certain con concepts and, and inform future designs. To build a class around an experimental design would have been sort of an afterthought because, again, they didn't know if it was going to be successful, and it would have been difficult uh, to do so uh, given the nature of the way these kind of test beds are, are usually used. Um, some other interesting innovations in there is that its, uh, reactor, its reactor had a scoop seawater injection, uh, which was not uh, repeated uh, based on a couple of things I could find online. This was actually a piece of the, uh, the project that failed. Uh, it did not meet the standards, the safety standards of the U.S. Navy. So that may be another reason that the S-5G uh, never was put in another submarine is, is su certain pieces of the boat itself failed to, to meet safety standards of the Navy. Uh, not that they were unsafe. The, the boat operated safely relative, as far as we know for more than 30 years, but they just weren't up to code basically basically, for what the, what the Navy wanted in its submarines. Additionally, there were other designs that uh, were examined uh, for use uh, with the Narwhals. So there was a submarine called the Conform class, which my understanding was basically a Conform submarine hull that was being examined for use in fast attack submarines that would allow U.S. submarines to be a little bit smaller, a little bit nimbler, um, a little bit faster, and still be quiet and modern in all respects. And this was a submarine project that occurred between the Sturgeon class and between the Los Angeles attack class that was examined and determined whether it was feasible. Um, it apparently has a rich history. This was one of those things that as I was researching this video, I looked into and the more I, I looked at, the more I found and uncovered and realized the, the Conform class could be a video of its own. But in essence, it seems to have been one, not entirely practical. Uh, again, they were in the process of building the Sturgeon class. They were building over 30 of them. The LA class was not yet here, but, but Rick Over, again, the brainchild of America's nuclear uh, submarine force, had this vision of a, a highly fast and potent uh, fast attack submarine capable of keeping up with fleet carriers uh, and operating you know below the surfaces and keeping up with the U.S. fleet because they found out that the Russian nuclear submarines were substantially faster. U.S. subs were only making around 25 knots uh, below sea since the, the skipjack. And the Russian submarines, especially the November class, were found to be much quicker. So it was decided that the U.S. submarines had to be fast enough to keep up with the fleet so they could provide escort against these fast Russian attack submarines. The Narwhal class, while its reactor was more powerful and while it was a very interesting submarine, its reactor was not powerful enough uh, to give it the speeds that the, the Navy was looking for in the next generation uh, nuclear submarine. The cotton form design actually theorized we could put two of these reactors in here and we could use it that way, uh, but at the end of the day, it was canned both for practicality, but also there was some politics involved. The S5G reactor was also considered for the uh, ULMS, I believe it was, which was a hypothetical nuclear ballistic missile submarine that would have come after Polaris, but before the Ohio class. Again, that falls into kind of the same realm of what uh, the... the um the conform class fell into. There was a lot of internal politics. There was a lot of uh, maybe lavishness or extravagance around the design that didn't really warrant uh, being considered. Um, it would have required a whole new missile system, a whole new uh, ballistic missile system. Uh, and, and frankly, at the time, the Polaris was just coming off the ways, just being completed. The Navy wasn't ready for a brand new class at that time, so things were postponed, uh, and, and that never came to be.
With that being said, despite the fact that the S5G never was put on another submarine, it did directly inform the S8G uh, reactor, which was later used in the Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. So the S8G is one of the quietest reactor systems uh, in operation. And it was similar to the S5G. It was a, a natural circulation reactor. I don't believe it allowed its submarine to operate at quite as high a, a power um, drain as, as the S5G, but it, it allowed its submarine to operate largely without coolant pumps. And the Ohio class is amongst the quietest submarines ever built. Uh, and this was directly you know, a result of the, the key learnings and understanding of the Narwhal class and its nuclear reactor. The Ohio's uh, reaction and propulsion gear uh, driving things through a single uh, turbine or a single drive shaft. Again, I'm not an engineer or a physicist, but essentially uh, the propulsion component of the reactor on the Ohio also uh, exactly mirrors the S5G's uh, and the Narwhal's propulsion system. So I think it's easy also to say uh, that that was directly informed by the Narwhal class. So again, not a, a follow-on class, but in many cases, you're probably ill-advised to have a follow-on class uh, for a prototype because you try a lot of different things, and the reactor wasn't the only thing. It was just kind of the most prevalent difference. But you try a lot of different things in a, in a prototype, and some of them work and some of them don't. The, sea, the saltwater seawater injection system didn't work well. Uh, or at least not up to Navy standards. The reactor's quiet, you know, quieting abilities did work up to Navy standards, and so then they can go and create a new reactor that takes the best of, of, of what you are successful with and ignore the pieces that you aren't successful with. In trying to dig up history about the actual USS Narwhal, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, I did talk to an individual of mine who I know who uh, works a little bit on submarines, uh, and he, you know, he mentioned that uh, they they kind of studied the narwhal in sub school, and that it was, you know, not entirely up to Navy standards. Although, you know, it's it's unclear exactly why. Um, you know, he did say that. Uh, well, that was his his recollection anyway. He said that it had the nickname as, informally as narwhal nar. <laughs> Narwhalski, uh, which is, I guess, interesting. I, I'm not sure what to make of that, um, but uh, it's uh, interesting nonetheless. Um, I found its pennant uh, moniker was, you know, when experience counts, which, um, again, is interesting. You consider a prototype boat doing everything for the first time and claiming experience is what's important. I guess that makes sense if you're saying, like, the experiences that you learn with the, the Narwhal will, will count for something. I'm not quite sure. Um, I did a little bit more digging as far as, like, the actual history of the boat. You know, this is, I wouldn't say it was a boat shrouded in mystery, but there just weren't a lot of good uh, things to, to talk about. No particularly interesting patrols or publicly available information anyway. I'm sure there were a lot of interesting patrols, but I would guess the vast majority of them were, were classified or semi-classified. It did show up on the nuclear uh, incident uh, moniker. So the, I guess, I think it's Greenpeace kind of tracks all nuclear incidents with nuclear reactors, be the civilian, military, or what have you. And there's two incidents where USS Narwhal is mentioned. Uh, one of them was during Hurricane Hugo. The submarine was uh, in uh, Charleston Naval Base in South Carolina. Uh, and two three-inch ship lines uh, and nine double wires uh, were, were torn off, sheared off uh, during the storm. Um, during the eye, kind of the, that lull in the storm, the captain, uh, you know, examines that the ship has drifted away uh, and into the center of the river in Charleston. And tugboats and, and the ship's crew tried to return her back to the dock, but they were unable to do that. Uh, so the submarine basically, rather than take on further risk, just submerged for the remainder of the storm. Not a nuclear incident per se, but, um, you know, something that happened in the life of the Narwhal. That was on September 22nd, 1989. A few years earlier in, 19, uh, in 1985, the Narwhal, um, you know, had uh, slipped its mooring cable in um, in uh, Palmero Bay in Palma, Mallorca, Spain. So apparently it had made a port call in Spain, slipped its mooring, and drifted for several hours until it could be recovered. Uh, this uh, occurred on New Year's Eve, so it kind of makes me wonder if there's a, a story there that we don't know about. Um, you know, maybe someone is partying too hard. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But um, in either event, this incident happened on New Year's Eve. Again, not really a nuclear incident per se, but for whatever reason, they mention it on, on the, the website that kind of lists all uh, incidents with nuclear reactors. 
if we actually look through the commissioning records of the ship, again, there's not a lot of, uh, of information that I can find out. In 1971 and 72, it did earn the Blue Nose Certificate. I think it's Nose, N-O-S-E, uh, which basically symbolizes the vessel crossing of the Arctic Circle. Uh, so essentially, the, the ship crossed through the Arctic Circle in, in whatever operations it was conducting at the time. Um, interesting, I suppose, not terribly informative. Uh, it went through its shellback initiation in January of 1975. This occurred in the Atlantic Ocean. I assume that's the emerald shellback, which is symbolizes the crossing of the equator at the Greenwich Meridian, so in the Atlantic Ocean. In 1980, it went through overhaul and refueling at Charleston Shipyard. That took, uh, I believe, three, no, two years, 1978 to 1980. And then again, it went through a further overhaul in Charleston from 1979 and until 1983. So for about five years there, it was out of commission um, with various upgrades and overhauls, most likely pertaining to the fact that it was a prototype boat with a lot of experimentation. So it had been at, sir, and it had, by, by that point, it had been in service for more than, uh, more than, well, almost 10 years when all that had started, so it was probably also in need for some modernization. It again crossed the Arctic Circle in 1984. Uh, it was deployed to the Mediterranean in 1985 to 86. Uh, the hurricane that we talked about, uh, Hurricane Hugen, occurred in 1989. Again, deployed to the Mediterranean from 1994 to 1996. Uh, and was eventually decommissioned in 1999. It had very much a up-tempo, um, you know, uh, an up-tempo deployment history, but very little is known about its actual operations. One would assume, based on the remote operating vehicle indications for the vessel, that it was used heavily in special forces. This would also make sense given the fact that uh, the submarine was um, the quietest submarine in the U.S. Navy. Uh, some reports say that was the case until some of the very late Los Angeles class boats. Some other sources say that th it wasn't until the Seawolf class came on board in 1999. Uh, or actually, that was 2000. No, 1997. Sorry, the first Seawolf class came out in two 1997. Some say it wasn't surpassed until that boat came out. And if that's true, it would make sense that it was decommissioned in 1999, given the fact that. Uh, the submarine, you know, was the quietest on record, and then when it no longer was, it was 30 years old, and they and they replaced it. And one last post-mortem that I found interesting is that after its decommissioning, uh, there was an attempt to turn the Narwhal into a, the centerpiece of the National Submarine Science Discovery Center in Newport, Kentucky, which the idea of a, a national uh, submarine uh, center in, in Kentucky is interesting. Are we going to dive it to the bottom of the river there or what? I'm not sure. Uh, but it was actually, there was legislation that was signed in 2003 that authorized the Navy to transfer the Narwhal to this museum. There were fundraising attempts that were ongoing. The reactor was going to be removed from the submarine uh, and replaced with a plug uh, of the proper dimensions and shape. Uh, and then, you know, it, it would add a theater and a classroom in the submarine as well. However, uh, after three years of fundraising efforts, only about a half million dollars had been raised. Uh, they needed $2 million in order for the actual conversion and the transfer to occur. That never was raised, uh, and the, the museum effort folded uh, never actually uh, ended up pursuing that exhibit due to the lack of fundraising. And uh, currently, the, sh the ship is still in Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. Um, I would imagine it's not in any kind of shape to go to sea if it were needed in an emergency. Probably be very expensive to, to overhaul and bring it up to standard, but still interesting. I don't know if that means it's in the mothball fleet or not, but uh, anyway... So that, that, that about does it with my musings on the USS Narwhal, an interesting submarine, uh, one of its kind, clearly a test bed for uh, the reactor as well as many other things, a seemingly successful boat, although uh, it, which inspired you know the most successful and quietest U.S. ballistic missile submarine class, the Ohio class, and also had some influences on later reactors that were used in, I believe the reactor used in the Virginia class has some lineage back to the reactor used in the Narwhal. So even though it was only a single ship class, it was successful in its own right. In terms of the game, it seems super quiet. It seems very difficult for the enemy to detect you. Its speed is a little bit low, but I, I don't generally race around at high speed trying to get in front of ships, so that doesn't matter. 
Its weapons platform are on on par with the Los Angeles class, but it's a little bit smaller, so it's a, it's much more maneuverable than the Los Angeles class, which in my mind makes it the best submarine for you to play with in the 1984 Cold Waters campaign. Uh, it's not available, obviously, in the 68 campaign because the boat hadn't been commissioned yet, uh, but that's kind of my own two cents. Uh, guys, I know this was a, a bit of rambling between uh, me talking about some game statistics and, and me talking about just kind of reading off a history, more or less, that I pieced together of the USS Narwhal. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the video. Let me know your thoughts below, certainly. And I'm, you know, I, I'm looking to do a little bit more of this kind of historical discussion mixed with some gameplay elements, and I hope you guys enjoyed. With that being said, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off there and say, as the historical gamer, thank you for watching. And I'm out.